Section thirteen of History of Egypt, Volume One by Gaston Maspero, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter two, The Gods of Egypt, Part five. Although none of the primitive temples have come down to us, the name given them in the language of the time shows what they originally were. A temple was considered as the feudal mansion, Hait, the house, Piru, P, of the god better cared for, and more respected than the houses of men, but not otherwise differing from them. It was built on a site slightly raised above the level of the plain, so as to be safe from the inundation, and where there was no natural mound, the want was supplied by raising a rectangular platform of earth. A layer of sand spread uniformly on the subsoil provided against settlements or infiltrations, and formed a bed for the foundations of the building. This was first of all a single room, circumscribed, gloomy, covered in by a slightly vaulted roof, and having no opening but the doorway, which was framed by two tall masts, whence floated streamers to attract from afar the notice of worshippers. In front of its façade was a court, fenced in with palisading. Within the temple were pieces of matting, low tables of stone, wood, or metal, a few utensils for cooking the offerings, a few vessels for containing the blood, oil, wine, and water with which the god was every day regaled. As provisions for sacrifice increased, the number of chambers increased with them, and rooms for flowers, perfumes, stuffs, precious vessels, and food were grouped around the primitive abode, until that which had once constituted the whole temple became no more than its sanctuary. There the god dwelt, not only in spirit but in body, and the fact that it was incumbent upon him to live in several cities did not prevent his being present in all of them at once. He could divide his double, imparting it to as many separate bodies as he pleased, and these bodies might be human or animal, natural objects or things manufactured, such as statues of stone, metal, or wood. Several of the gods were incarnate in rams, Osiris at Mendes, Harshafitu at Heracleopolis, Kanumu at Elephantine. Living rams were kept in their temples, and allowed to gratify any fancy that came into their animal brains. Other gods entered into bulls, Ra at Heliopolis, and subsequently Ptah at Memphis, Minu at Thebes, and Montu at Hermonthes. They indicated beforehand by certain marks such beasts as they intended to animate by their doubles, and he who had learnt to recognize these signs was at no loss to find a living god, when the time came for seeking one, and presenting it to the adoration of worshippers in the temple. And if the statues had not the same outward appearance of actual life as the animals, they none the less concealed beneath their rigid exteriors an intense energy of life, which betrayed itself on occasion by gestures or by words. They thus indicated, in language which their servants could understand, the will of the gods, or their opinion on the events of the day. They answered questions put to them in accordance with prescribed forms, and sometimes they even foretold the future. Each temple had a fairly large number of statues representing so many embodiments of the local divinity, and of the members of his triad. These latter shared, albeit in a lesser degree, all the honors and the prerogatives of the master. They accepted sacrifices, answered prayers, and if needful they prophesied. They occupied either the sanctuary itself, or one of the halls built about the principal sanctuary, or one of the isolated chapels which belonged to them, subject to the suzerainty of the feudal god. The god has his divine court to help him in the administration of his dominions, just as a prince is aided by his ministers in the government of his realm. This state religion, so complex both in principle and in its outward manifestations, was nevertheless inadequate to express the exuberant piety of the populace. There were casual divinities in every nome whom the people did not love any the less because of their inofficial character, such as an exceptionally high palm-tree in the midst of the desert, a rock of curious outline, a spring trickling drop by drop from the mountain to which hunters came to slake their thirst in the hottest hours of the day, or a great serpent believed to be immortal, which haunted a field, a grove of trees, a grotto, or a mountain ravine. The peasants of the district brought it bread, cakes, fruits, and thought that they could call down the blessings of heaven upon their fields by gorging the snake with offerings. Everywhere on the confines of cultivated ground, and even at some distance from the valley, are fine single sycamores, flourishing as though by miracle amid the sand. Their fresh greenness is in sharp contrast with the surrounding fawn-colored landscape, 
and their thick foliage defies the midday sun even in summer. But on examining the ground in which they grow, we soon find that they drink from water which is infiltrated from the Nile, and whose existence is in no wise betrayed upon the surface of the soil. They stand, as it were, with their feet in the river, though no one about them suspects it. Egyptians of all ranks counted them divine and habitually worshipped them, making them offerings of figs, grapes, cucumbers, vegetables, and water in porous jars daily replenished by good and charitable people. Passers-by drank of the water, and requited the unexpected benefit with a short prayer. There were several such trees in the Memphite nome, and in the Letopolite nome, from Dashur to Giza, inhabited, as every one knew, by detached doubles of Nuit and Hathor. These combined districts were known as the land of the Sycamore, a name afterwards extended to the city of Memphis, and their sacred trees are worshipped at the present day, both by Mussulman and Christian fellahin. The most famous among them all, the sycamore of the south, Nihit Risit, was regarded as the living body of Hathor on earth. Side by side with its human gods and prophetic statues, each nome proudly advanced one or more sacred animals, one or more magic trees. Each family, and almost every individual, also possessed gods and fetishes, which had been pointed out for their worship by some fortuitous meeting with an animal or object, by a dream, or by sudden intuition. They had a place in some corner of the house, or a niche in its walls, lamps were continually kept burning before them, and small daily offerings were made to them, over and above what fell to their share on solemn feast days. In return they became the protectors of the household, its guardians and its counsellors. Appeal was made to them in every exigency of daily life, and their decisions were no less scrupulously carried out by their little circle of worshippers than was the will of the feudal god by the inhabitants of his principality. The prince was the great high priest. The whole religion of the nome rested upon him, and originally he himself performed its ceremonies. Of these the chief was sacrifice, that is to say, a banquet which it was his duty to prepare and lay before the god with his own hands. He went out into the fields to lasso a half-wild bull, bound it, cut its throat, skinned it, burnt part of the carcass in front of his idol, and distributed the rest among his assistants, together with plenty of cakes, fruits, vegetables, and wine. On the occasion, the god was present both in body and double, suffering himself to be clothed and perfumed, eating and drinking of the best that was set on the table before him, and putting aside some of the provision for future use. This was the time to prefer requests to him, while he was gladdened and disposed to benevolence by good cheer. He was not without suspicion as to the reason why he was so feasted, but he had laid down his conditions beforehand, and if they were faithfully observed he willingly yielded to the means of seduction brought to bear upon him. Moreover, he himself had arranged the ceremonial in a kind of contract, formerly made with his worshippers and gradually perfected from age to age, by the piety of new generations. Above all things he insisted on physical cleanliness. The officiating priest must carefully wash— Uabu, his face, mouth, hands, and body, and so necessary was this preliminary purification considered, that from it the professional priest derived his name of Uibu, the washed, the clean. His costume was the archaic dress, modified according to circumstances. During certain services, or at certain points in the sacrifices, it was incumbent upon him to wear sandals, the panther skin over his ear, and the thick lock of hair falling over his right ear, at other times he must gird himself with the loin-cloth having a jackal's tail, and take the shoes from off his feet before proceeding with his office, or attach a false beard to his chin. The species, hair, and age of the victim, the way in which it was to be brought and bound, the manner and details of its slaughter, the order to be followed in opening its body and cutting it up, were all minutely and unchangeably decreed. And these were but the least of the divine exactions, and those most easily satisfied. The formulas accompanying each act of the sacrificial priests contained a certain number of words, whose due sequence and harmonies might not suffer the slightest modification whatever, even from the god himself, under penalty of losing their efficacy. They were always recited with the same rhythm, according to a system of chanting in which every tone had its virtue combined with movements which confirmed the sense and worked with irresistible effect. One false note, 
a single discord between the succession of gestures and the utterance of the sacramental words, any hesitation, any awkwardness in the accomplishment of a rite, and the sacrifice was vain. Worship as thus conceived became a legal transaction, in the course of which the god gave up his liberty in exchange for certain compensations, whose kind and value were fixed by law. By a solemn deed of transfer the worshipper handed over to the legal representatives of the contracting divinity such personal or real property as seemed to him fitting payment for the favor which he asked, or suitable atonement for the wrong which he had done. If man scrupulously observed the innumerable conditions with which the transfer was surrounded, the god could not escape the obligation of fulfilling his petition. But should he omit the least of them, the offering remained with the temple and went to increase the endowments in Mortimer, while the god was pledged to nothing in exchange. Hence the officiating priest assumed a formidable responsibility as regarded his fellows. A slip of memory, the slightest accidental impurity, made him a bad priest, injurious to himself and harmful to those worshippers who had entrusted him with their interests before the gods. Since it was vain to expect ritualistic perfections from a prince constantly troubled with affairs of state, the custom was established of associating professional priests with him, personages who devoted all their lives to the study and practice of the thousand formalities whose sum constituted the local religion. Each temple had its service of priests, independent of those belonging to neighboring temples, whose members, bound to keep their hands always clean and their voices true, were ranked according to the degrees of a learned hierarchy. At their head was a sovereign pontiff to direct them in the exercise of their functions. In some places he was called the first prophet, or rather the first servant of the god, Han Nutur Tapi. At Thebes he was the first prophet of Ammon, at Tinnis he was the first prophet of Anhuri. But generally he bore a title appropriate to the nature of the god whose servant he was. The chief priest of Ra at Heliopolis, and in all the cities which adopted the Heliopolitan form of worship, was called Oruhu Mal, the master of visions, and he alone, besides the sovereign of the Nome, or of Egypt, enjoyed the privilege of penetrating into the sanctuary, of entering into heaven and there beholding the god face to face. In the same way, the high priest of Anhuri at Sebenitos was entitled the wise and pure warrior, Ahuiti Sau Uibu, because his god went armed with a pike, and a soldier god required for his service a pontiff who should be a soldier like himself. These great personages did not always strictly seclude themselves within the limits of their religious domain. The gods accepted, and even sometimes solicited, from their worshippers, houses, fields, vineyards, orchards, slaves, and fish-ponds, the produce of which assured their livelihood in the support of their temples. There was no Egyptian who did not cherish the ambition of leaving some such legacy to the patron god of his city, for a monument to himself, and as an endowment for the priest to institute prayers and perpetual sacrifices on his behalf. In course of time these accumulated gifts at length formed real sacred fiefs, hapu nutir, analogous to the wax of Muslim in Egypt. They were administered by the high priest, who, if necessary, defended them by force against the greed of princes or kings. Two, three, or even four classes of prophets, or Hier Oduli, under his orders, assisted him in performing the offices of worship, in giving religious instruction, and in the conduct of affairs. Women did not hold equal rank with men in the temples of male deities. They there formed a kind of harem whence the god took his mystic spouses, his concubines, his maidservants, the female musicians and dancing women, whose duty it was to divert him and to enliven his feasts. But in temples of goddesses they held the chief rank, and were called Herodules, or priestesses, Herodules of Neat, Herodules of Hathor, Herodules of Pakit. End of section 13. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.